Medcram. Well, welcome to another Medcram lecture. We're going to talk about the effect of different things on the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay, so we've got a red blood cell from end on. Kind of also looks like that with a little bit of a bulge in the middle, and that's because it's lost its nucleus. What this is, you have to remember, is simply a bag of hemoglobin. It's got no nucleus, it's got no mitochondria, so the only form of energy that it can do is glycolysis or glycolysis. And remember, that's where we get glucose, and it goes to, basically goes to pyruvate, and that gives off forms of ATP. This is not oxidative phosphorylation. This is substrate level phosphorylation, but it gives the cell the ATP that it needs. And that's important because there's an intermediate in this glycolysis that's actually going to uh, do some things to our hemoglobin binding curve, which we're going to talk about next. But before we get to that, I wanted to explain to you what the hemoglobin molecule looks like. If you can kind of imagine it's four different subunits that are connected to each other. Okay, and usually there's two alphas and two betas, but uh, that's not important right now. So there's four binding spots for oxygen to bind to. So if it binds to the first spot, what happens is it causes a conformational shift with the next one that causes oxygen to bind more affinitively. And that causes a conformational shift with the next one, which causes the oxygen to bind even more affinitively. And finally, that causes a conformational shift that causes the last one to bind with even more affinity. And so what happens is you get something called cooperativity. The other term that they like to use in biochemistry is called allosteric uh, interaction. Um, in this case, it's not allosteric inhibition because it's actually making these globin molecules more apt to bind the oxygen molecule. The other thing that you might want to be aware of is sometimes they have different terms for these hemoglobin uh, subunits. If they are not bound to oxygen, they're known as the tense form or T. And if they get bound to oxygen, then they're known as R or the relaxed form. The other thing that happens that you may want to know is that when an oxygen binds to this hemoglobin molecule, a little carbon dioxide molecule comes off, a little CO2, and you should probably know that that's known as the Haldane effect. Just some trivia there. So that when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it releases CO2, and if you see the CO2 go up a little bit, that's known as the Haldane effect. But let's talk about the hemoglobin binding curve. So the way that this is represented, we've kind of talked about this before in the other lecture on delivery of oxygen, is there's a relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood and the saturation of the hemoglobin molecule. So this is saturation here, and this is PaO2, and uh, we can take that all the way up to 100. So this is 100, this would be 50, this would be 25. 75. This is the PO2 that we're talking about here. And up to about 80, we're starting to see here that um, there's a kind of a, a curviness to this hemoglobin binding curve. And so the key points here that I want to show you is that there's this sort of a plateau area here where increasing levels of PO2 will not yield much more in terms of the saturation. So there's kind of a diminishing marginal utility uh, associated with that. The other thing I want you to sort of notice is that if we were to shift this hemoglobin binding curve to the right, in other words, if it were to go from this point to this point, notice that in fact what you're seeing here is you're seeing the hemoglobin molecule as a whole being more apt to release oxygen. It's more apt to release oxygen. And why is that? Because at a, any given PO2, let's say 50 in this case, you'll see that in the, the blue hemoglobin binding curve has a lower saturation than the yellow hemoglobin binding curve. And so therefore, 
the blue hemoglobin binding curve is more apt to be less saturated at a given PO2 than the yellow hemoglobin binding curve. And that's important because what's actually happening is this thing is shifting back and forth as it goes through the bloodstream, depending on where it is. So this is kind of something that you should know. So here's a question. What are some things that are going to shift the hemoglobin binding curve to the right? And remember, these are things that make it less affinity. So the things that make the hemoglobin binding curve less affinitive to oxygen are all of the things that you would expect to find in the blood where oxygen needs to be given off by the hemoglobin molecule, and that would be in the muscles or placenta. And what are they? What do you find in the muscles? Are you going to see a high or a low pH? You're going to see a low pH because this is where lactic acid is being produced. This is where carbon dioxide is being given off, and we know that carbon dioxide is a Lewis acid. Number two, we would see a high temperature. Okay, your muscles are hot, right, when they're working, so that would shift it to the right. Um, we already said that a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to shift the hemoglobin binding curve to the right. Another thing that shifts it to the right is a molecule called DPG, diphosphoglycerate, otherwise known as 2,3-BPG, or bisphosphoglycerate. This, as you may recall, is an intermediate of glycolysis. And this is where 3-phosphoglycerate goes to 2-phosphoglycerate. And that's an important step in glycolysis because as that happens, and as you have this buildup of 2,3-BPG, which is, by the way, seen elevated in pregnancy, which makes sense because in pregnancy you're going to want your hemoglobin molecule to be able to give up more oxygen to the fetus you're going to do that. You're going to see this increase in pregnancy, and you're going to see your hemoglobin molecule giving up more oxygen to the fetus, and you're going to see this hemoglobin molecule shift to the right. Okay? Now, what are some things that you would see cause it to shift to the left? These are things that you would see in the lungs. So, for instance, in the lungs, you're breathing off carbon dioxide. You're going to have a low acidity, so you're going to have a high pH. Of course, in the lungs, you're breathing in air, which is cooler than body temperature. So generally speaking, you're going to have a low temperature. Number three, as we already mentioned, we're going to have a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And of course, four, we're not going to see maybe possibly as much DPG. And so you're going to see a shift to the left. The other thing that will shift it to the left is fetal hemoglobin. So H, not A, but actually F, which is way out here. Okay, And that's fetal hemoglobin. Sucks up that oxygen like no other hemoglobin as it comes by the placenta. So that is the hemoglobin molecule and the disassociation curve. Thanks for joining us.